Welcome everyone. It's just four o'clock and we'll wait for a few more people to come to our event, but welcome to Young Professionals Tackle Gender Health Disparities. We're all pleased you're here. We'll give it just a few minutes to let people come into the room and get settled. And we'll start in about two minutes. All right, I think I'll get going. Um, welcome everyone. Welcome to Women MC's second presentation at the Commission on the Status of Women, or the 66th Commission on the Status of Women. Um, we are so pleased that you all are here. I know many of you are on Facebook Live. So welcome to those of you viewing us on Facebook Live. Uh, my name is Maria Murray Ryman and I'm executive director of Women NC. Um, we have been around for 13 years and we've been coming up to uh, CSW for all of those 13 years. Um, and today's presentation um, is in collaboration with some of our peers from Harvard's Healthy Buildings Program, from Emory University School of Public Health, um, as well as former Women NC scholars. Um, we also welcome the Global Gender Center to this discussion with Anna Perez. Um, we'll say more about our panelists um, in a minute, but I wanted to say just a few words by way of introduction about Women NC. Some of you know us, um, on, uh, some of you know us as Women NC, and you know about our scholars program. Um, that program has been in existence for 13 years. We train undergraduate scholars. Two alumni who you will meet later um, are part of that program. It's a leadership training program. We work and pair our undergraduates with femtors, our way of talking about mentors. We pair our undergraduate scholars with femtors from RTI's Global Gender Center, and they engage in actionable research projects to improve the lives of women and girls. In the last year or so, we've also begun a second program, our community lunch and learn events, our critical conversations, where, like today, Women NC acts as a convener of subject matter experts. Bring, we bring these experts together on issues that concern our constituency, and we have dialogues that inform the audience um, about the issue, give them resources for further education, and empower them to advocate on behalf of the issue that they feel passionate about. The third prong of our work at Women NC is as a lead organization for the North Carolina Coalition for CEDAW, which many of you on the call will know stands for the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women and Girls. We are the lead organization in North Carolina, have helped pass resolutions in Durham City and Durham County, and are moving across the state to make more cities, towns, and counties more equitable places for women and girls. So that's a few words about women and C. Um, you're going to um, you're going to not hear from me for most of the rest of the program, but let me, by way of introduction, introduce to you our moderator for today's event, Professor Joseph Allen. Joseph Allen directs Harvard's Healthy Buildings Program. 
an associate professor at Harvard's TH, uh, excuse me, TH Chan School of Public Health. Dr. Allen also co-directs Harvard's Public Health and Business Leadership Program. As well, he is the Deputy Director of the Harvard Education and Research Center for Occupational Safety and, ha and Health. There's much more I could say about Joe, but I think I'll stop because what's most important for today's event is that he is also a skilled moderator and has agreed to moderate this important panel at today's UN's CSW, the title of which is Young Professionals Tackle Gender Health Disparities. Um, and uh, again, by way of introduction, we have women NC alumni, we have folks up at Harvard's Healthy Buildings Program in various degree programs, we have Emory University represented and RTI's Global Gender Center. We are so pleased to be part of and help convene a conversation among these varying types of organization, all of whom have an interest in women's health and understanding the gender disparities that ensue. So I think with that, Joe, um, I will turn my camera off, give it to you and um, let everyone hear what they've come to hear. That's great, thanks Maria. Uh, what a pleasure and privilege to be here moderating this panel. And I think the most important part of that introduction is that we should get me off the screen right now. I promise to be in the background of this conversation. We should bring up a picture of all our wonderful panelists because I think you're in for a real treat today. Um, these are uh, women who are not only leading in terms of the research they're doing on these topics across multiple aspects of health and built environment, but they're also practitioners, right? but they have a, a burning interest to be sure that the research they're doing doesn't just live in academic journals, but actually gets out and influences uh, the health of people everywhere. As we think about the setup for this uh, topic, I think about the multiple crises we're, we're currently facing. We have the climate crisis. We have a built environment crisis, rapid urbanization happening at scale we haven't uh, seen before. We have an urban housing crisis. We have an affordable housing crisis. We have an incarcerated population housing and health crisis. We have a global chemical crisis. Um, and we're going to talk about all of those today in different elements, but I wanted to highlight uh, maybe some themes of where those intersect. And, uh, and, and it'd be, be remiss not to mention maybe the biggest one that's impacting us all right now for the past two years, which is the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. And as you think about all of this, and I think in particular COVID, what has, it has brought out uh, to the forefront that we've known has been there and is always there in, uh, in all the public health work we do, but I think uh, COVID has reminded us of this, or certainly brought it and started to highlight it, are the vast disparities we see in terms of people's health and access uh, to care and access to clean environments. So um, as we get into this topic, we're going to be focused on these gender differences, but also racial and ethnic differences, differences by uh, economics, people uh, of different uh, incomes and economics uh, having disparate uh, uh, burdens placed on them through these systemic problems and structural issues uh, across our environment, the products we use, the, the products we use on our body, the products we use in our buildings. Um, so all of these things are all coming together, and COVID has really, I think, exposed us and maybe hopefully woken people up, people who weren't paying attention. I think a second key theme is, is the importance of uh, environmental health and environmental health practitioners in this conversation. My guess is that most of the public didn't know what public health was or even is until uh, COVID hit. And then my view is that when, when the public started to become aware of this, uh, very quickly, epidemiologists became the catch-all expertise uh, that, that was meant to encompass all of public health. And I think that's uh, epidemiologists are wonderful. I think many people here uh, consider themselves epidemiologists, but that's not where, uh, that doesn't en encompass all of public health. Uh, and the role of environmental health uh, is absolutely critical. And in fact, in the domain of public health, it is their efforts to marginalize the field of environmental health. And we're gonna show in this conversation why that'd be a massive mistake. And in particular, focus on how good environmental health science and practice 
can address some of these gendered environmental health issues. I wrote an article a couple of years ago with a, a colleague talking about how research around healthy buildings could be leveraged to advance health for all. I'm gonna take it broader, it was about healthy buildings, but it fits this moment. I'm just gonna read the last paragraph because it, it brings out some of the larger issues that we're gonna get into around the built environment. We believe the most important aspect of the burgeoning built environment healthy buildings movement is ensuring that the research and its applications benefits everyone everywhere. A future that is confined to a, a future of this, these benefits confined to a select few would be a gross failing. Researchers must play an important role here by creating studies that include globally diverse buildings and exposures, races and ethnicities that have been historically underrepresented research, a focus on the unique needs, physiology and preferences of women. This has been ignored in my field, our field, uh, for far too long. And so um, I'm gonna uh, bring in the panelists, introduce them a bit more here, and we're gonna start not just talking about the problems that I just mentioned, but really uh, what the solution space looks like. So we have five terrific panelists and um, uh, the board, well, I'll introduce uh, them in a row right here. We have Jackie Lanning. She's an alum of the Women NC Scholar Program. She has her bachelor's degree at North Carolina State University where she led student organizations focused on women's health. And she was awarded the 2020 Undergraduate Equity for Women Award to recognize her activism and service on campus, putting research into practice. She's currently a master public health student at Emory University with a focus on epidemiology. She's worked with federal and state level public health agencies on maternal and child health projects. And after graduation, she hopes to secure a position where she can use her skills and experience to address the social determinants of health and improve maternal and child health outcomes. I'm certain you'll be scooped up quickly for your next uh, position. Next, we have Dr. Annie Young. She's a postdoctoral research fellow in our Healthy Buildings Program right here at the Harvard School of Public Health. And she focuses on, well, many things, I know, but uh, uh, she's gonna be talking about her work on healthy materials and products in buildings to think about how we reduce these chemical exposures uh, to toxic mixtures. She recently earned her PhD from the Harvard School of Public Health and her Master of Science degree from our Department of Environmental Health. Third, we have Sandra Dedesco, current PhD student in our Environmental Health Department at the Harvard School of Public Health. She focuses on building design and operation strategies to promote occupant health and environmental sustainability, that nice merge of climate and build environment crises. Uh, Sandra has a, a bachelor's and master's degree in civil engineering, and she's worked as a professional engineer in the sustainable building design industry before coming to Harvard. She's got great work experience. She's passionate about, passionate about translating scientific findings to practical applications and remains involved with education delivery and advising on the development of building standards. Fourth, we have Anna Perez, senior energy and gender technical advisor at RTI International. RTI leads climate aligned programs across the world. RTI's technical assistance for reducing GHG, greenhouse gas emissions, spans across many sectors and jurisdictions from city, regional, national, with a focus on stakeholder engagement. She's going to bring a real wide lens here on thinking about uh, how we address some of these issues. She's provided technical gender advisory services to energy organizations in 12 countries across North America, Middle East, Africa, Asia, true global lens. She's associate director at RTI Global Gender Center. That's a cross institute center with more than 400 internal and external multidisciplinary experts working to address gender inequality. And she holds an industrial engineering degree and MBA from IE Business School in Madrid, Spain. And last, certainly not least, Nyla Segule, master's student in our department right here at the Harvard School of Public Health in the Department of Environmental Health. She's a research assistant on the Healthy Buildings team. And Nyla's research is uh, focused on the built environment, pollution and environmental health disparities. And she just won a prestigious uh, award from USAID, a Donald M. Payne Fellowship. She's part of the fellowship class of 2020. And after completing her master's degree next year, she'll work uh, very soon, sorry, she'll work for five years at USAID as a foreign service health officer. All right, so all that to say, uh, impressive backgrounds and bios, but really these are the, uh, the, the leaders. I don't like saying future leaders because they're already leaders in this space. They're current and future um, leaders. We're gonna cover a whole range of topics. One quick housekeeping note before, uh, so you understand how this is gonna work. Each panelist can open up with a five minute presentation. Then we're gonna have a, a moderated Q and A. Uh, and we'd also invite uh, you all to submit questions through the question and answer function uh, down below. So send in your questions, we'll try to bring them in uh, and, and definitely towards the end. We're gonna cover a broad range of these topics, uh, but let's get right into the presentations and I'll open it up and pass uh, the floor and the mic to Jackie. 
Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. Uh, I'm so honored to be invited to speak on this panel, and I'm very excited to share with you all the work that I did as a Women in C Scholar uh, in 2019. Uh, next slide, please. So the Women in C Scholar project that I did was titled The Impact of Environmental Toxins on Maternal and Child Health in Durham, North Carolina. And this project was focused on the intersection of reproductive justice and environmental health. So in 1994, an activist group, the Women of African Descent for Reproductive Justice, created three guiding principles for reproductive justice. And the third principle is the right to parent children in safe and healthy environments. So this principle emphasizes that reproductive justice is not only having the ability to make decisions about one's sexual and reproductive health, but it's also having access to safe environmental conditions that to live a healthy life. Next slide. So environmental toxins are synthetic or naturally occurring chemicals that can accumulate in the body and lead to disease. High exposure to environmental toxins can negatively impact health, especially during pregnancy. These effects range from premature births to miscarriage, and even infants born with high exposure from their mothers can experience delayed neurodevelopment and learning challenges. And because of these additional potential health complications, pregnant women carry a higher burden of disease compared to non-pregnant women or men. And, and systemically marginalized communities often have a higher risk of exposure to these toxins. Next slide, please. So as a woman and C scholar, I investigated what factors were related to exposure to environmental toxins in Durham. I reviewed the current research um, on the issue, and I also distributed an electronic survey to Durham residents to assess what were their current attitudes and awareness uh, towards environmental toxins in their health. And I was able to do that through a partnership with a local nonprofit, the Partnership Effort for the Advancement of Children's Health, which is a mouthful, but they also go by Peach Durham. Um, and they were a nonprofit that were already doing work in communities with the highest risk. Um, so from my research, uh, other I found that other studies had identified downtown Durham as a high risk area for exposure to environmental toxins. This uh, map on your screen is a street map of the downtown area and uh, researchers uh, use census data and blood testing records to identify areas with the highest risk, which they're highlighted in dark blue. And they also found that three factors were uh, highest, had the highest correlation of uh, risk of lead exposure. And these factors were race, poverty, and the age of home. And so um, the areas in dark blue, along with having the highest uh, lead risk exposure, they um, also have a large pr proportion of predominantly black communities and low income neighborhoods. And in fact, five out of the 16 communities managed by the Durham Housing Authority were uh, located in this area of downtown Durham. And um, a statistic, 48% uh, of units owned by the Durham Housing Authority are female headed households, households with children. So the statistic just further strengthens why women's health and specifically maternal health Health should be at the center of conversations around what healthy housing uh, should look like in Durham. Next slide, please. So uh, for my survey, I surveyed 16 uh, Durham residents to gain an understanding of the current attitudes and awareness of environmental toxins. Only 20% of residents reported being well informed about environmental toxins. 47% uh, were concerned about their exposure. 19% were able to recall having a blood test uh, for environmental toxins and 44% practiced preventative cleaning habits more than once a week. Next slide. So as a woman and C scholar, I was tasked to not only do the research, but develop policy recommendations. And so I uh, proposed two policy recommendations to reduce the impact of environmental toxins on maternal health focused in Durham, North Carolina. First, the Durham County Public Health Department should uh, partner with the Durham Housing Authority to implement a tailored public health campaign to increase the awareness and knowledge of those with the highest risk of exposure. And second, healthcare providers in Durham should encourage blood testing women um, of reproductive age 
who are living in these areas with a known um, risk of uh, heavy metal exposure. And uh, these two policies were uh, important because all residents in North Carolina deserve to live and parent in safe and healthy conditions, regardless of their race, gender, or economic status. Uh, thank you, and I'm excited for our next panelist. All right, so uh, Jackie just talked to you about gender disparities and exposure to metals that are toxic to reproductive health. And I'm gonna focus now on our exposures to chemicals that are toxic to reproductive health. Next slide. So to put this in context, there are at least 70,000 different chemicals that were registered globally just in the last decade alone. And of those, an astonishing 16% aren't even publicly identifiable due to confidential business information. And what's even more concerning is that the vast majority of chemicals aren't tested for human safety before they're added to products. So as a result, we're exposed to really complex mixtures of thousands of chemicals in our buildings and in our products. Next slide, please. And many countries haven't been successful at restricting even the chemicals we do know are harmful to health. Uh, and so just as one common example, phthalates are a group of hormone disrupting chemical plasticizers that are commonly added to personal care products like cosmetics, furniture, electronics, and many other products. And this is concerning because generally hormone disrupting chemicals like these are pr problematic and can be linked to outcomes like infertility, pregnancy outcomes, fetal development, and even diabetes or obesity. Next slide. So Dr. Joe Allen and I with other collaborators recently conducted a study of the exposures of both male and female office workers to complex mixtures of chemicals in the US, India, China, and UK. And in order to pinpoint their indoor specific exposures, we had the 251 participants wear these novel silicon wristband samplers, as you can see in the photo. And they wore these wristbands only while they were at their office buildings for four days. And these wristbands collected chemicals from the dust and air and products they were exposed to while they were wearing the wristbands. One finding we had was that office workers who had reported higher use of cosmetics, such as makeup, perfume, or cologne, were exposed to significantly higher amounts of one phthalate that is commonly used in those products. And those cosmetic users were more likely to identify as female than as male. So we saw this gender disparity with chemical exposures globally in these office buildings. Next slide, please. Now we wanted to take this study one step further and look at the implications of their exposures for reproductive hormonal health. And this is brand new data we haven't published yet. So we conducted lab cell assays of the chemical mixtures collected on the wristbands that the office workers wore. And, and to do this, we exposed human cells in the lab to the chemical mixtures. And that included hundreds of chemicals that are likely unknown. And then we quantified how much those chemical mixtures disrupted hormones in the human cells. And we found that nearly all of the participants were exposed to chemical mixtures that mimicked testosterone in human cells. So because it's acting like testosterone, it was impairing the perfectly fine-tuned function of the natural hormone in those human cells. And likewise, over half imitated estrogen in human cells. So the air and dust and products in our buildings are contributing to hormone disruption and uh, these chemicals that are exposing people in buildings are having significant implications for the function of our sex hormones. Next slide, please. Interestingly, office workers who identified as female had chemical exposures that interfered with the sex hormones even more than for those who identified as male. And this held for all countries. And what's especially interesting about this result uh, for the methods we use is that Within each office building in the study, we sampled multiple office workers, about seven. So the female and male identifying workers were theoretically exposed to similar office environments, but there's something disproportionately exposing the females. And one potential hypothesis goes back to what we were just talking about, about the differential use of personal care products and other cosmetics and how those chemicals can stick around in our skin and our clothes and in the air throughout the day. 
um, and how there are likely many known and unknown chemicals that are being used in those products and that can disrupt hormones. Next slide, please. Now that result isn't surprising since we know people identifying as women use more personal care products on average. And we know that women also have higher levels of those beauty related chemicals in their urine or blood. Now, I also wanna highlight the environmental injustice of beauty in the context of intersectionality and the disparate exposures of women of color. For example, black women in the US have been shown to have higher rates of infertility compared to white women and relatedly to use more uh, beauty products with hormone disrupting ingredients like hair relaxers, hair oils and skin lighteners. And this is why it becomes really important to investigate upstream solutions to lessen these determinants of gender and racial ethnic disparities. For example, through solutions targeted at you know, mainstream beauty standards and marketing about what professionalism looks like, targeted at natural hair discrimination in the workplace and other solutions that go beyond only addressing the chemical ingredients used in these products. And a lot of this work has been led by Dr. Tamara James Todd, Ami Zoda, Shruti Mahalingeya, and many others. And I'm excited we'll be collaborating with some of them in a new study. Um, but if you'd like to learn more, um, please be sure to check out their work. And I'll end that there. And I think Sandra will now talk to you about gender disparities with the building systems. Great, thank you so much, Anna. Hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here, and I'm really excited to be discussing gender disparities with respect to building design, and specifically, next slide, please, uh, thermal comfort. And what exactly do I mean by thermal comfort? Uh, casually speaking, this is how you and I feel in the space. It's really trying to get at that Goldilocks zone of being not too hot and not too cold, but just right. Um, of course, you know, from an engineering perspective, we have to make it a bit more technical than that. Um, so ASHRAE, the organization that sets a lot of building standards um, that most of the building stock is designed to, they define thermal comfort here on this slide as the condition of mind that expresses satisfaction with the thermal environment and is assessed by subjective evaluation. So highlighting some individual differences there right off the bat. Um, to the left on the screen, you'll see that they actually include six factors in their definition or assessment of thermal comfort. And these include four environmental factors, kind of starting at noon and going clockwise to six. And then the two on your left, um, those are two personal factors, uh, the metabolic rate. So that's based on how active you and I are and also our clothing insulation. So just based on how much clothing you're wearing that day, how much warmth you'll get from that. Now it is these two personal factors and also the subjective evaluation and those individual preferences that leads to many scenarios, like you'll see on the next slide. Um, like this, this is a real life uh, reconstruction of one of my former workplaces where uh, my office mate Travis, and this is no exaggeration, Travis used three fans, up to three fans at a time to cool himself off. while I had three space heaters under my desk, or sorry, two space heaters um, under my desk to, to warm myself up. Um, and so if we have these building design standards that acknowledge both environmental and personal factors, uh, you might be wondering why am I, and probably yourself and most often many females, typically so uncomfortable and typically cold in buildings. If we go to the next slide, I'll explain at just a very high level. Um, the way the standard tries to account for these six factors is to define a zone, this comfort zone that is shown in that kind of light purple. Um, and this defines a range of conditions that most people, according to the standard, should be comfortable under. Um, at, a, at another high level, sorry, on the next slide, basically anything just to the left, shown in blue, someone in those conditions would be too cold and on the next slide, um, anything above that zone shown in red, um, that would be too warm for this you know, uh, population defined by the standard. Um, but if I take into account the, the same indoor conditions, so those um, the series of dots just there in the center la labeled indoor conditions, if I take those same indoor conditions that were measured during a summer in a typical office, and I apply some of these more specific personal factors that I've mentioned, so on the next slide, 
if I apply a metabolic rate that's more representative of say a typical female and a typical male, and I also account for their typical clothing in the summertime, uh, you'll see that those zones that we talked about, those purplish zones have shifted in both pictures on the left and the right. And that now those um, dots representing the experience of the, the comfort for women, they're now too cold. And for the males, they are too warm. Um, and so what this means, if we go to the next slide, there are several implications of this. If we, if we pause and consider that, you know, we can break it down scientifically or we can think anecdotally and from our own experience that a lot of us, particularly females are too cold and we have this standard um, that looks at these differences or that is, if we use the standard and see these differences between groups, um, when we consider that the standard itself was based on experiments in the 1960s um, that typically, or that looked at males in three piece suits and their metabolic rates at the time, um, the standard and much of our buildings have been designed around settings that promote the thermal comfort of men, typically at the detriment of women. And you know what this means most obviously is that women are going to be uncomfortable, thermally uncomfortable in their spaces. And we've seen that this gets worse over time and it can impair performance and cognitive function and highlights a substantial physiologic barrier in addition to some of the other challenges that women will face um, that my colleague Anna Perez will talk about next. Um, but from a climate change perspective, we're also spending a tremendous amount of energy trying to condition these spaces to temperatures that aren't even comfortable for a large portion of today's workforce. And so fortunately, there are solutions that we can use to promote comfort and performance of both women and also save energy, with just one example highlighted um, by a Japanese initiative, Cool Biz, where they relax the dress code to accommodate um, relaxed set point temperatures to not only save energy, but also create um, more adaptable and comfortable positions for a, a broader range of the population in today's workforce. So this is just one solution to just one challenge. And I know Anna Perez will highlight many more in the next session. Thank you, Sandra, and great session. A mind that is stretched by a new experience can never go back to its old dimensions. That's a quote from Oliver Holmes that describes how I feel about um, uh, gender matters. And hopefully today's session is able to bring you new insights and new perspectives to you. Urbanization is at the center of many of today's urgent global challenges, including climate change, COVID-19, corruption, migration, bio biodiversity loss, and health. Cities contain over 55% of the world's population and consume nearly 70% of today's of the, of the world's energy and are responsible for more than 70% of the world's carbon dioxide emissions that generate 80% of the global GDP. We're expecting that by 2030, over 60% of the world's population will live in the urban areas with almost all of them residing in the, in the developing world. The next slide. Cities are also growing at an unprecedented levels, particularly in Africa and South Asia. While most of those buildings and infrastructure are still yet to be built, the large emissions uh, reductions that can especially be made from the buildings or transportation and, and waste sectors are about 24% by 2030 and nearly half by 2050. And all that combined with that transformative ad adaption of the build to build resilient net zero cities. The current high emission paradigm for buildings can be transformed by developing stringent, stringent codes and standards for new buildings and appliances, and also retrofits of existing buildings. Next slide. Globally, we cannot achieve the Paris Climate Change Agreement, Climate Agreement target of limiting global warming by 1.5 Celsius without cities achieving net zero emissions by 2050. 
Currently, we have more than 1,000 cities worldwide that have already committed to net zero um, and aiming the reduction uh, emissions by 2030 and reaching net zero by 2050. However, getting to net zero requires transformational and systemic change across all rural, urban development systems, also including energy, water, mobility, shelter, buildings, waste management, health systems, food systems, and entire ecosystem. The next slide. Without a strong legal and regulatory framework to guide the upgrading and construction of the new developments to be climate smart, equitable, and efficient, the current development problems across climate, pollution, biodiversity, and health are very likely to worsen. And women play a key role in this process. Unfortunately, sectors such as the construction sector and the energy sector are male dominated. And women, women's participation in the decision-making and leadership roles uh, is paramount as we build net zero cities. On the next slide, you, you'll see how energy policies are not gender neutral. Policy decisions have implications on how on gender equal, equality or inequality. To understand the extent in which gender is being mainstreamed in energy policies at national levels, in 2017, the International Union of the Conservation of Nature, IUCN, a Global Gender Office in collaboration with Energia and the, um, they conducted uh, an assessment of 192 energy policies, plans and strategies. And on this slide, we're referring, to, we're referring them as frameworks. And they cover 130 um, developed and developing countries. The assessment was conducted under the uh, Gender Equality and for Climate Change Opportunities Initiative that was a five-year collaboration between IUCN and, and USAID. Of all these policies that they uh, reviewed uh, and frameworks, 32% included women and or gender keywords, as you can see on the first, on the figure on the top. And a total of 90, 993 gender keywords are included in, in these documents. A figure, the, the, the bottom portion in this slide shows the distribution of those keywords. What's important to highlight is that including gender related keywords in national energy frameworks and policies indicate some level of awareness and considerations relevant to the energy sector. And perhaps a pro precursor to any potential action to advance gender equity, for example, by rec recognizing the differentiated roles and opportunities that women and men as energy providers and users have. On the, on the next slide, it's also not to talk about the, the representation and, and the policies. And if, at the, in the formal energy sector um, gender gap, in the, um, there's a, there's a um, formal energy sector gap in, in the employment is, is, is significant. And of course it varies country to country. However, representation only is showing us some visible gender gaps, but there are also many invisible gaps that need to be addressed at a systemical and institutional level. A large growing of evidence uh, demonstrates the correlation between gender diversity in an executive level and, and, and um, company performance. But despite this evidence uh, demonstrating that the women's value in the workforce, women continue to encounter structural barriers uh, to participating in the world economy, particularly as in industries traditionally dominated by men. On the next slide, you see that an entry point to identify those invisible uh, inequities, gender inequities that I mentioned are at the institutional level is to focus on the employee life cycle from attract, attraction 
uh, and talent outreach, all the ways to retirement, retirement and separation. And there are numerous uh, opportunities to, to promote gender equity within organizations. On the next slide, uh, to serve as a guide to implementing gender uh, equity practices throughout the employee life cycle, USA developed a best practices framework as a part of the engendering utility program. And on this slide, you can see an example of best practices that organizations can uh, use specifically to address gender inequities in the recruiting, recruitment and hiring uh, processes. To conclude, I'll say that women play a key role in, and it is paramount to consider the differences, the gender, the, the gender different, um, the difference in gender needs to address today's global challenges and to ensuring a resilient and healthy environment for all. Thank you. Hi everyone, and sorry if you end up hearing any construction, it's a hazard of living here in Boston. My name is Nyla Segula and I'll be talking about my research as well. Uh, so, so many of my panelists have talked about climate change and building science. And to summarize why that is so important, we need to be thinking about exposure. Americans are spending 90% of our time indoors. So this is really where we're getting exposed to a lot of different things. Emissions, as Anna Perez said, buildings are a significant emitter of greenhouse gas emissions and they can further exacerbate climate change. And lastly, equity, who has to be living in sick buildings? One case study I'll be looking at for climate change and building science and gender is refugee camps. So we can international found that women make up 80% of climate refugees. They're more likely the ones who have to deal with the environmental issues we're seeing in refugee camps. Just some notable examples for you in Bangladesh, a lot of the camps have had to deal with flooding, which has significantly impacted the Rohingya refugees. In Greece, we've seen first a wildfire affect the Moira migrant camp, and then the replacement camp having to deal with lead concerns. These are issues that aren't just isolated to Greece or Bangladesh, but a lot of previous studies have found that refugees who enter the US have elevated blood lead levels, showing that recently their exposures likely from refugee camps are actually exposing them to lead and there is no safe lead level for anyone. So my particular research focuses on prisons. Uh, individuals who are incarcerated are unable to make choices that can really protect them from worsening climate change. Uh, decisions on evacuating during a hurricane, they fall onto the warden. And there's a little transparency in this process. We have seen time and time again, several prisons choosing not to evacuate while the rest of the surrounding area is encouraging residents to evacuate. During COVID-19, lockdowns have been a critical tool used in prisons to reduce transmission, but often this has left many incarcerated individuals unable to access vital heat mitigation tools like extra showers uh, during summer heat waves. So my talk today will go a little bit into thermal comfort that Sandra mentioned. Uh, anecdotes from women who were incarcerated really inspired this work as they felt that women had access to prisons that were older, had poor quality prisons. Uh, and so we incorporated this dynamic as we try to do our environmental hazard assessment of prisons. There are certain health conditions such as diabetes, certain medications like psychotropics or high blood medications. And also when dealing with detoxification of alcohol and drugs, all of these health conditions can make it really hard for you to regulate your body temperature. And so when you're exposed to extreme heat, uh, it makes it difficult for you to prevent heat stress and you're more likely to be susceptible to the other heat related illnesses like heat stroke and sometimes this can even be fatal. In the summer of 2011, the Texas prisons had 10 people actually die from heat related deaths. So what we've found is that women who are incarcerated compared to men are actually overrepresented in these health conditions that are more vulnerable and having challenges with thermal regulation. Women have higher chronic health conditions. Women are 
we're seeing a higher percentage of them represented in diagnosed mental health issues and for serious mental health illness. Uh, women are more likely to be diagnosed as drug dependent or abusing drugs or have used drugs before they went in, were incarcerated. Um, so because we're seeing this overrepresentation of women as having a lot of challenges with thermal regulation, it really is up to us to really be raising the alarm on the need for better temperature carceral condition policies. Uh, nationally, there is no regulation to ensure that prisons are an ideal temperature for anybody. Uh, and AC availability is also not universal throughout the US with many prisons in the South actually lacking any AC availability despite climate change causing us all to have increasing and increasing 90 degree days, which the National Weather Service says is really cautious in those conditions um, because it can really impact your health. Another dynamic we need to be thinking about is people who are pregnant and they're in custody. Um, pregnancy and prison statistics found that 4% of females and admission to state prisons were actually pregnant. So here's another subpopulation who also is really vulnerable to heat stress and that can have a significant impact on their fetus, um, but we're not building the policies or the structures or accountability to best protect these individuals. My concentration in environmental health is also on occupational health. So I wanted to briefly touch on some of my work on occupational health and the gendered COVID-19 vaccine rollout. Um, so working with Care International, we've been trying to see who is being left behind in the COVID vaccine rollout. And this is an issue both in the US and globally as prioritizing certain occupational groups who are high risk for COVID-19 makes sense. Um, but what we know from the UN is that 70% of healthcare workers are women. So why are we tending to see that men are the one more likely to be getting COVID doses? Um, big things that we're thinking about is when you say that the doses are going to health workers, who is being explicitly excluded from that term? Uh, women are definitely dominating in roles such as doulas, caregivers, community health workers, and they may not feel that they're actually properly being included in this work and not a lot of advocacy or outreach might be going to getting these people vaccinated, despite all the patient time these people are seeing. Uh, in the US and Spain, we've even seen that female healthcare workers had more COVID-19 infections compared to men. And so a lot more needs to be known about how women and men in these occupational spaces are actually being included and how is the risk differing because of their access to patients. Lastly, I wanna talk about the purposeful exclusion of pregnant individuals. Many countries actually chose to exclude pregnant people from their COVID-19 vaccine rollout. And in Senegal, that's 3% of their population that they chose to exclude. A lot of it went to the idea that vaccines might not be safe for pregnant individuals. Um, but while these countries chose to exclude pregnant women, um, we've seen in Europe and in the US, pregnant people being prioritized and actually a health condition that went above others in the line because of their extreme risk for severe COVID. So it is critical that we actually include and never exclude pregnant individuals and allow them their autonomy and decision-making during this pandemic and beyond. Thank you. Okay, thanks everybody. That's, um, uh, that's a lot. I, I could have listened to that for, for another, uh, you know, for another hour at least, because I just learned a whole bunch and maybe most importantly, um, I ditched my tie. I learned uh, from Sandra, I'm wearing uncool business attire, but most importantly, uh, it's exacerbating gender inequities in the office and contributing to our climate crisis. So I needed a reason to ditch the tie. So thank you all towards the spirit of, uh, of leveraging research to changing behaviors on the spot. So um, I want to um, pose an opening question to everyone and I'll give you a minute to think about it for a second. Um, but I guess, um, I'm always interested in, in how researchers, young researchers, are drawn to topics. So why, why, what grabbed you about these? You can study anything in this field, but why these topics? What grabbed you? What is something that stood out? Why did you each pursue this? So I'll give you a minute to think about that. Well, I just want to mention to our audience again, 
we really want to uh, hear your questions and we want to weave them in. So take a, um, a minute if you can, anybody listening, pop questions to question and answer. And we'll do our best uh, to bring in your questions and thoughts and take advantage of this uh, terrific panel. All right, so maybe before we jump in into some of the meat, I'm just curious, uh, what, what drew you to these topics? We can go right around the horn um, from uh, uh, in the order we presented. So Jackie, you wanna just give us a second here on, on yeah. why that topic? Thanks for asking that question. Um, I, the, this Women in C project was my first project um, related to environmental health. Um, and one of my professors at NC State shared her research during class, uh, which was involving, she um, took blood blood samples from over 300 women in Durham and mapped it. And she showed that map on the screen and it sparked my curiosity. I wondered who lived in these high risk areas. And then after learning that the most affected populations were lower income communities and communities of color, I felt that there was this was an issue that needed to be addressed. And, I had uh, done previous work in women's health, but I, I never saw that intersection between environmental health and maternal and child health. Um, and so, yeah, I hope that that can uh, inspire other people that if they kind of hear something in the news or they read about something to run with it and uh, see how they can get involved with local nonprofits. Uh, it may not look like conducting a survey or anything like that, but uh, definitely connecting with other people uh, in the field that are already doing the work. Thanks, Jackie. All right, Annie Young. Yeah, thanks for that question, Joe. Um, I think like most people, I had no idea about the prevalence of toxic chemicals in our environment. I assumed if a product was on the shelf, it was safe. The chemicals must have been tested for safety, which I learned in college was very untrue. Um, and just thinking about how, you know, cosmetics and makeup are disproportionately used by women and the implications for, for fertility and reproductive health in so many different ways um, inspired me. And, and when I started the master's program here, I got involved in a project with you and others about nail salon workers and thinking about um, the most vulnerable populations, like Nyla was saying about people who are incarcerated, thinking about you know salon workers who are exposed day in and day out to these these chemicals in their workplace. That's right. Thanks, Anna. Yeah, remember the nail salon worker, right? The work everyone's attention goes to the person going in. Well, what's the exposure? People sometimes their entire families there all day, every day, long duration exposures, poorly ventilated environments. Uh, okay, uh, uh, Sandra. Thanks. Um, yeah, I always had a real inherent interest in the environment and also health. And it was actually my mom who pointed it out to me when I started this program. She said, isn't it funny that in high school you were on the environmental and wellness committees and here you are full circle in environmental health. <laughs> um, but it was really um, uh, like the practical application of engineering that drew me to that program initially um, and designing buildings to reduce their contribution to climate change kind of captured my interest. And then um, during my master's work, that's when I was introduced to the concept of healthy buildings. Um, and really working in practice kind of opened my eyes to all these decisions that are just, you know, pushed through and made and really not nearly enough consideration of the health implications. And that was a real motivation to come back to this program and gain some experience and knowledge in public health. Thanks, Sandra. And thanks to your mom. Anna, Perez. When I think about the future, I see the energy sector as a, as a thriving market and that one that will benefit from the perspectives of a gender inclusive workforce. And unfortunately, the energy sector workforce, it, the like, demographic of the sector and their policies are still very skewed to, towards mature male. And the sector can also provide very uh, good, well-paying, uh, employment opportunities that uh, can allow more women to reach financial independence. And that was something that was very important to me and the reason why I decided to, to dedicate my career on, on the integration on, on gender and, and, and the energy sector. Thanks, Anna. Okay, Nyla. What got me into environmental health at first is a, a music video. So my family is uh, Tanzanian immigrants. So there was a musician, Diamond Platinums, who had a song called Mbagala, where every step he took in this trash city, he was stepping on a piece of trash. And so seeing this video made me think about what is the health impacts of this? 
Um, if you think about all the rain that comes down into this area and there's trash everywhere, it leads to all this stagnant water. And so you can have a real increase in malaria because all the mosquitoes are able to breed easier because this trash isn't being removed. Um, so that really first got me into like, you are where you live and the impact of your zip code on your health. Uh, my whole life, everyone says you are what you eat, but never enough, you are where you live. Uh, and really inspired me to join the Healthy Buildings team. But my prison work uh, got started with COVID. <laughs> I had not done any of this work before the pandemic, but seeing people incarcerated in New York who were actually working in the morgues and burying people who died from COVID, um, getting to do some COVID strategy mitigation for jails. Uh, that first got me into this occupational health work and seeing how you know so much is tied to these exposures and how much transparency we need. So thanks everybody for sharing that. I, I, so I find that all really inspiring. I think these origin stories of how we end up in these fields and uh, it's really important. It shapes our, our research clearly and how we talk about it. And hopefully for people listening, uh, I'm sure inspired a couple of the people to pursue their, uh, these topics that really don't get enough attention. So on the theme of, um, all right, we know these are problems. What do we do to do better going forward? And maybe I'll start with uh, Anna Young and then also bring in Jackie here on, on the solution set here. I mean, Anna, you just showed some quite honestly shocking new data on gender disparities in the workplace around chemicals that we know interfere with our hormone systems. So um, what does that solution set look like? Is, it, is the burden on the individual to kind of just choose better products? So, you know, what's, that, what's the solution here for the global chemical experiment issue? Thanks, Joe. And I think Jackie and I um, both mentioned this, that it's really important that the solutions are removing the burden from the consumer. Um, and because it's really hard to decipher chemical ingredient labels on products, even as scientists in the field. Um, and labels of products can be really deceptive and misleading. Um, Joe and I had a study about nail polish and, and how even ones labeled as non-toxic had had issues for hormone disrupting chemicals. So I think, uh, you know, it needs solutions need to go more upstream. We need to make sure that even if we remove one toxic chemical from certain products that we're not just replacing that with another toxic chemical, and this endless cycle of substituting toxic chemicals for toxic chemicals. And like I mentioned, we can even go even more up upstream and thinking about um, addressing issues and determinants of disparities when it comes to mainstream Eurocentric standards of professionalism in the workplace and, and beauty standards and how advertising is sometimes targeted to certain groups um, for use of those products. So I'll follow up with one question for you. It's one I get all the time and um, it's along the lines of, you know, uh, while we have to have these institutional level changes, uh, what do we do right now? What do you do in your own home, your own life? Uh, are these unavoidable at this moment? What do you, how do you approach this just in your daily life. I can jump in, um, which uh, I think, Anna, you covered a lot about uh, how to reduce chemicals within your makeup products or other products that you bring within your home. Um, the research I was looking at was uh, what happens when your home is built on an environment that has high levels of lead in the soil. You can't necessarily avoid that, um, especially if you're uh, a resident of publicly funded housing. You may not have um, a quite as much in the decision making of where you get to live. Um, and so during my research, um, kind of what that education campaign may look like or could include was possibly taking off your shoes when you enter your home, wiping down your countertops uh, with a wet wipe um, to not accumulate dust that may um, come out from the soil. Um, but to echo Anna uh, Young's point about that these are really putting the burden on those um, that are at the highest risk and that there should be more pressure and more talk on how do we um, address those upstream interventions and what does systemic change really look like, um, which I really uh, loved Anna Perez's and uh, Sandra, uh, your presentations about how do we get women involved um, at the building process. Yeah, let, let's stay with that theme and then bring in Anna and Sandra on that, you know, right, there's some, so there's some individual, there are things that we can do, sometimes often limited, and some people uh, can't do anything. 
uh, because of the structures in place that prevent them or keep their exposures high. Um, so let's get to that institutional change. Anna, you really presented Anna Perez really nicely on this and have a nice framework, both at the you know, international, national level. Um, but what, so what is that? I know you have a particular interest too on how do we affect change at the, the company level? And actually I'll bring in a question that one of our audience members brought in, you know, how do we engage companies on these topics across healthy materials and products, environmental pollution that impacts our health um, and where we site buildings. So how do we do this systemically and maybe engage companies to do better? Thank you. Well, with the, what's happening with the climate change, like the reduction on emissions is, is paramount. It's like a, it's a call to action that it has to take place now. And there's definitely um, organizations are aware there's all these different uh, global commitments to, to reduc reduce emissions. And the, the, the now, taking it now, if you know, if the leader of the organization now has decided that yes, we want to do something about our environment, is um, looking internally. I'll say at, at two two ways. One from from an institutional perspective, like what what are the things that can take place at a, at a, at a systems perspective, the ones that I mentioned. But then from a, from another perspective, is at an individual level, like the, the people that are working and how they interact with each other to ensure that um, the commitment stays and um, that, yeah, that, that commitment stays. For example, what Sandra was mentioning on an, a way to reduce emissions from the building is with the, um, uh, what, what Japan did with uh, reduce, increasing the temperature in the, in the buildings in the summer months and changing the clothing that they were wearing. By doing that, they reduced the emissions significantly. And was well, not only a reduction in emissions, it was also the millions of dollars that they saved from the energy uh, that they were not longer using. Yeah, I like that, really smart to think about the economic drivers here. Um, and Sandra, you're similarly, right? You're, you're, I know the work you do on, on trying to change um, how we think about our buildings and not just thermal comfort, thermal health issues, but more broadly. So maybe, um, be great to bring that in some of the work you're doing on, on advising and on how we design our buildings differently, all the, the work you do with standard setting bodies. So not government necessarily, but these non-governmental organizations that do influence code and practice. And I know you're deep uh, in that movement. Yeah, thank you for bringing that in because it is really exciting to see these more voluntary building certifications and frameworks um, pushing forward these different design factors that go, like you said, beyond thermal comfort and look at things like air quality water quality, access to daylight, nutrition, and even going beyond and um, bringing like um, early parent care into the equation, um, lactation rooms now being built into voluntary design standards and acknowledging that there's a need for diverse spaces and diverse occupants and they're gonna you know, change, their needs are gonna change over time. Um, and this real trend too, I know in architecture, um, like neurodiversity and starting to account for that in design understanding that we're all unique individuals and interact and experience our spaces very differently and that we need to do a better job accounting for that. And I know Anna Perez and I had a really wonderful discussion and talking about, you know, how can these changes come to be and how can women be more involved in them? And um, we were sharing stories. I think one of the most successful cases I've seen is when um, there was like an independent sustainability organization all women at um, a company that decided they were gonna lead an initiative. And we did a full like healthy building assessment for them. And they did make all of these tweaks like thermal comfort, lighting. Um, and it sounds like an infomercial, but you could hear people as you made the adjustments saying like, wow, I feel so much better. I feel alert. And it was a really cool example where women decided, you know, they were gonna get together and address a problem and lead a change just in their organization with real impact. I also want to add from less systematic side, um, but what I'm really seeing too with the COVID-19 pandemic is a lot of individuals who are, you know, looking into jobs, applying um, healthy buildings are really a part of the conversations that people are starting to have. As we're thinking about return to work plans, I want to know how easy it is what is your ventilation like? What is the air quality? What other standards are in place? Are you requiring vaccines? 
Um, so I think the pandemic is really opening up what company, companies are having to know about their buildings um, because people don't want to go to buildings they think are unsafe. I remember once in your class, Joe, uh, people even on reviews of companies commenting about, you know, this building is really hot, the air quality is really bad. Um, we've even seen for prisons, some prison staff supporting lawsuits that are going on that are led by people who are incarcerated because they're having to experience these temp terrible temperatures too. Um, so it really is also a movement of occupational health to really push the healthy building movement into more, you know, less formal standard setting and more if you want the staff to be recruited and retained, you need a better building. I like that, Nyla, and I, I think on a couple of themes here, right, I think the pandemic has certainly uh, opened our eyes to some of these issues, uh, and, and many buildings have, in fact, made improvements, but I wonder, bringing it to the topic we're talking about today is, um, with all that awareness, uh, I haven't heard much at all about the uh, gender inequities in the workplace and the environment. So, you know, I, I, I really haven't. I don't hear it a lot in our field, this healthy buildings field, for example, or all across all these topics. And I wonder how we how we change that. Is it just through uh, more research? You know, Jackie, I know in, in your slide, something caught my eye early on, not necessarily about that specifically, but uh, in your survey, only 20% of people felt well-informed about the topic. And I kind of feel like maybe that's the issue here too, is that, you know, when you hear your presentations, it, like it should affect change tomorrow, it feels like they're so powerful. So what is that pathway here as people are maybe paying attention to the built environment more because of the COVID crisis, climate crisis? Uh, how do we drive the gender inequality in the built environment conversation a bit harder here? I think like Anna Perez said, it really is about having more women in the decision-making space. Uh, like with Sunrise Movement, we saw the Green New Deal, but that then had to lead to a specific feminist Green New Deal that really was gender inclusive. Um, and so I feel like instead of making gender neutral policies, we need to assume everything is tied to gender. Um, and ways to do that is including more female faculty in environmental health. What can we be doing to boost in recruitment of women? Uh, I know in our program, we're female dominated. Um, but even in like engineering, where a lot of us have our backgrounds in, is very male dominated and is setting a lot of these standards for temperature is like ASHRAE is, you know, a bunch of engineers. Um, so how do we do all of this work with so many of these fields are male dominated? A nice comment come in the chat, more women in STEM for sure. And I agree with you now in our department, right? We're, I mean, I, I have a biased view because of our the students we work with. I get front row seat to all of um, you know the most powerful, smart women in the entire field. But in our faculty, it doesn't; it's not represented that way. I think there's been improvements made recently, and I think that's. I don't think I know there's an issue across faculty, not just public health, but faculty across all the uh, STEM fields. Anybody else want to comment on thinking about how to elevate this conversation, uh, maybe even outside of the the field of public health? How do we push it out of our own silo? would like to comment on something. One very important part is to have more women in STEM and have also women part of a, um, the workforce. And, and also not only bringing the workforce, but also retaining, like keeping in the right in the workforce and advancing in the workforce. Uh, today I'm, I'm um, dialing in from Ecuador where I'm uh, attending um, uh, old week event with um, a different um, different members, key members of uh, the energy sector in Latin America, the ministry, uh, people representing a ministry of energy from different, 16 different countries. And we are here meeting to talk about gender and energy and how as we're looking at the, our policy, uh, energy policies, how are these countries are, um, even though they include gender words or they, they're not, they're st we still have a long ways to go in terms of understanding what does that mean? What does it mean to be um, uh, equitable or have a, a social inclusion component in these policies? Because whomever is executing those policies doesn't know. It, this, this um, even though we've been speaking about gender for many, many years, uh, there's still a lack of understanding or what does that really mean um, at this execution level? So I think that 
it's very important to continue having dialogue, to continue bringing um, uh, the level of awareness and by having conversations and collaborating to trying to figure out ways in, in how to tackle this very complex problem. Yeah. And Jackie, maybe from your I mean, experience on, on how to do that with your uh, the public health advertising campaign in Durham to educate, you know, are these models that we should apply to the chemicals issue and, uh, and maybe, talk, maybe talk about what you saw successes there or things that can be done, you think, better next time or, or how we uh, leverage kind of your, your skill there and your practice? Yeah, um, I think that, like the panelists said, um, it's, I think people feel that it's the, the chemicals they're exposed to are not, may not be in their control or they may not even understand that relationship to their health since they are long-term exposures that then lead to chronic or long-term diseases. Um, and so I think that again, focusing uh, the education um, and awareness on the individual level is important. And so to then kind of get this pressure to uh, leaders and, and at the systemic level. Um, and so I do advocate for everyone should understand what uh, is affecting their health and should have some ability to change that. Uh, but I, I also think that we should not steer away from uh, focusing on the leaders and the people that are in charge of um, protecting our health um, when they build Buildings. Yeah, thanks for bringing it back to that. Yeah, Nyla. Um, one thing I wanted to tie in from Anna and what Jackie just said is it made me to think about the racial dynamic with products. Like all the makeup I use is makeup my mom used. So if she's been exposed to this chronic exposure that I, of course, got in utero, uh, I'm using the same brands. Um, because there's so limited options for women of color, you kind of keep this tradition alive versus a lot of my white female classmates might be able to go buy, you know, more organic products that more are in line with their skin tone. So even like the beauty industry needs to think about that. Um, but I also want to stress, this isn't just a STEM issue. Um, so many calls I go on for my prison work, I'm the only environmental health person. <laughs> I'm the first person on these calls to bring up that we need to talk about heat or AC or have to be educating people about built environment. Uh, I even gave a guest lecture to the incarceration health class here at Harvard about environmental health and was the first time we spent a whole hour and a half really talking about environmental concerns in prisons. Um, so we also need more in STEM, but we need more of this interdisciplinary connection. People in med school shouldn't just be learning about climate change, they should also be learning about buildings and chemical exposures. So every part of our life needs to really encompass this public health, environmental health awareness. Yeah, Nyla, thanks for uh, your first point about beauty products and like the options that people even have access to. And that makes me think of incarcerated populations too. And, you know, there are some ways you can choose healthier products, but who has the opportunities to make those choices for themselves? It's a really interesting point. Um, and also on your second point, I wonder if we can also help leverage businesses and you know, owners to help people with work from home because when, when you are working from home and homes sometimes have even worse chemical exposures and metal exposures like Jackie's saying, and who's liable for, you know, if you're working now, <laughs> spending all your time at your home basically, how is that affecting your health and your productivity and, and who can help you make that building healthier? Also tagging onto that, Anna, like the work from home situation with the prevalence of AC and who has access to that. I know for so many, like even myself included, like the office was where you went when you wanted to hide out during a heat wave or like a hot period in the summer. And the work from home situation really took those places of um, those cooling opportunities away. And I know just personally, I could feel myself kind of wilt as the day went on. So um, there really is, there are these imbalances like in the workplace, but also these new hybrid scenarios and so many factors. That makes me wonder too, for the women component, like so many women I think are also really interested in having work from home because of the issues with childcare and COVID-19 in schools, the burden 
as we've seen with this she session is for women to stay home. Um, so maybe we're also seeing this gender dynamic of more women are staying at home and the home is where the worst <laughs> exposures are. So what is that really meaning? All right, so um, let me bring this um, to a, a, an important question for everybody. I mean, I'll start with Anna Young is, um, uh, you know, I think that we get asked this all the time in our field. Uh, when we have a seat at the table, as Nyla mentioned, we need to demand that seat at the table. But um, when we act, do we actually see a difference? In other words, if, our, if you all put together your best and brightest policies and put them forward, we're certain they're going to work. Is a policymaker going to say, well, show me the evidence that that actually leads to a meaningful change if we invest X hundreds of millions of dollars in some intervention? Uh, is there quantifiable benefits to that? And I know, Anna, you've been doing some of um, this work on that question. Yeah, yeah thanks for, for setting that up. And we, we had just finished a study, Joe and I, um, about you know, how organizations can leverage their purchasing power to to have product standards for um, the requirements for what's in or isn't in these, these products that they're buying. Uh, so we studied a university that um, had these product standards where the furniture and carpet were completely free of certain harmful chemicals like flame retardants and the stain repellent forever chemicals. And they were able to you know, renovate the buildings with these healthier furniture and carpet without effects on performance or cost or project timing. And what we found is that in the healthier buildings compared to the conventional buildings, that the levels of these chemicals in the dust were more than halved when you were using healthier materials. So that was a really clear example um, where you can have affordable building materials that make a measurable difference. Um, and can be expanded to many other organizations. That sets up a powerful argument for action. Um, so what about others in, in uh, the topics you focus on? You know, uh, Sandra or Jackie, you see, you know, uh, successful intervention studies, even at small scale on metals or thermal health or other factors where we can point to that kind of evidence? I would say definitely. I think it is it gets a little tricky when you're trying to motivate um, like a health-based policy because unlike other things, maybe say related to energy conservation where you can stick a real dollar amount on it, it becomes a little more of a, a challenging conversation. But um, I think we do see measurable benefits from the research in terms of um, improvements in comfort satisfaction, but also measurements of cognitive performance. Um, I think too, if, if we're trying to be strategic, I really like the cool biz example in Japan where we can you know, feed two birds with one scone, we can have improvements in thermal comfort and occupant satisfaction while also um, striving towards our energy and carbon reduction targets. I know that's a really nice example where those two like climate and health work synergistically and it's not always the case, but I think we can do a much deeper job diving in and trying to think of solutions that better balance both. Seems like that always gets brought up as um, as the issue, this kind of energy versus health as this, rather than, as you've all pointed out, particularly you and uh, Sandra and Anna pointed out that actually they're working. When we have these policies that address things like gender inequities, they're actually good climate policies and good health policies. Of course, those are interrelated, but like any field, our field can be siloed too. But you've all done a really nice job of showing us how these you know, separate topics are actually all um, super intertwined. So thanks. Um, I want to bring in uh, a question, which um, I'm personally interested in too, is, you know, we have about 10 minutes left. If anyone wants to submit a last question to go right ahead. But um, I want to talk about uh, a question that somebody put into the uh, comments, which is um, what your five-year plans look like or where you plan to go with your future passions. And I'll give you a second to think about that, but I, I think it's important to bring that question in and, and for many reasons. Um, one, I'll take it to myself. Uh, I have a daughter, she's 12, and um, one of the things I just love teaching in public health is that she has all these terrific role models uh, in front of her all the time and, and thinking about her own passions and what she wants to pursue. So you've all given us um, uh, you know, the basis for what grabbed you about these topics. So the, the next one is, now that you're deep on these topics, you're the lead, leading the field on these topics, what's the next five years for you look like in terms of research, professional growth, 
uh, or maybe other topics you want to pursue that you think are the next topics in uh, gender inequities and environmental health. So um, any first, um, anyone want to go first before I call in somebody? Nice Lila, you know your five-year plan. Yeah, I think. <laughs> uh, so I will be working at USAID as a foreign service health officer. Um, so part of my goal is to continue doing environmental and occupational health work there. They do have their like pollution division. Um, but outside of that, I hope to continue with my prison work. One of the things that I've been working a lot on is how do we bring all these NGOs who are at the intersection of environment and incarceration together and bring them with researchers who can do the research to design, you know, real policy interventions real things to actually change what's going on uh, in our field. You know, if you don't have the data, if you don't have a specific policy action to ask people to do, uh, nothing changes. Um, so actually trying to start building that infrastructure in. What does that look like for you? Um, th that's really powerful, that last comment on you know specific policy actions. I'm definitely guilty of this myself. What are the uh, specific policy actions you can think of for the incarcerated population, particularly around uh, incarcerated women? Like, what would you, given access to the White House today, what would you say? What's the I think the big ones from our work is trying to work on thermal comfort. So requiring every prison to maintain certain temperature points. Um, right now, we've been looking at these heat policies and comparing them to ASHRAE, and these temperature standards are really all over the place. <laughs> Um, and also trying to actually incorporate real-time air quality and temperature monitoring. A big challenge we're having is people don't trust prisons. So really incorporating sensors and other tools into these spaces um, will really go a long way to actually showing, you know, what people are actually being exposed to. Um, and even thinking about requiring AC availability. Um, so these are all, you know, with the nine foundations of healthy building, everything has something to work on, um, but also using the voices of those incarcerated to actually work on what they want. Like all of the gender analysis came from people's lived experiences. I didn't know it as an outsider. Um, so striving to really include the gender lived experience in our work. Yeah, it's terrific, Nyla. Well, Sandra, maybe that's a nice um, handoff to you in particular on the thermal health and thermal uh, comfort issue. And you know, you're just starting, you're not just starting, I guess you're midway through your PhD program. What's the next, let's call it two years instead of five years. What's on the immediate horizon for you? I was gonna say, I can only guarantee the next two years. <laughs> um, but for the next two years, I'm really excited to dive deeper into my doctoral research. Um, the, the, there's many aims uh, and many passion projects along the way. I think the things I am really excited about, and even from the preliminary analyses we've been doing, um, is to look at these different associations between thermal health and other indoor environmental exposures and to see how it changes things that we can measure like these cognitive metrics of performance, um, but also these more subjective um, measures that we're pulling individuals and occupants about. And I know, you know, as an engineer, I'm guilty of wanting the most quantitative, what I think is the most rigorous measure. Um, but taking a step back and understanding that, as Nyla said, it really is kind of that personal experience and these individual factors and that lived experience that is going to really probably have the most impact for the individual. Um, exploring more of these um, different types of metrics and seeing the types of health associations and where we can intervene to make healthier and more equitable built environments. Yeah, thanks, Sandra. And thanks for all your work on, uh, uh, particularly with the building standards too, and, and forcing these conversations uh, to be had. Yeah, so I get a front row seat to Sandra's PhD program. I'm very excited. Um, okay, Anna, that's a nice, actually, Anna Perez, pass to you because I started to hear these same themes. It's thermal health. It's, it, it's a, it all ties into climate and energy at, you know, at scale. So we're talking about these different population centers, offices, incarcerated population. Now we have a global problem uh, in that tie-in. So what's that, what are the next five years of that massive climate challenge look like for you? Well, I am super excited about the five, next five years. I know that there's a lot of work to do and, and at RTI, I have the, the privilege to, to dedicate 100% of my time on, on advancing gender equity in our projects. And uh, we have projects uh, worldwide. So each of the 
projects that we have on climate change um, or, or the energy uh, projects that we're implementing, each of them have their specific um, uh, peculiarities that make it for me super excited to continue keeping myself up to date and uh, also um, not only using the knowledge but turning it into practice and uh, implementing it on, on the places where, where we are um, where we're working right now and uh, also for me in the next five years something that I see as key is the um, continue to work um, as well with with men to engage them in this sector to help advance gender equity um, uh, well to, to, to reduce the inequities that take place because uh, we all have a, a very important role to play and sometimes men uh, may not see it and don't see it exactly how it relates to them or how what is it something that they can do and um, so my next five years include that path uh, that very important component uh, on it thanks for bringing that in Anna okay hey, Anna Young sure so uh I'm a postdoc right now, but in the next few years, I'm planning to apply for faculty jobs in uh, public health schools and can hopefully continue this research. I'd like to include more on gender and racial ethnic disparities and reproductive health. So uh, we've been design a, designing a, a longer term study, uh, trying to get at uh, fertility disparities. For example, there are a few studies who have shown there are disparities in fertility, but there's even less known about the determinants of those. And I think that's mostly because uh, IVF fertility clinics um, is often where that data com comes from. And those are more high income populations with little diversity. So we're trying to advance tools to sample exposures and fertility from home um, so that we can, you know, involve a more diverse population and, and understand upstream solutions that might help. It's a brilliant set of research, Anna. Also lucky to have a front row seat there. <laughs> okay, Jackie, um, what's, what's it look like for you? Yeah, this is the scariest question for someone that's <laughs> graduating in two months. Um, but um, um, right now I'm going to be graduating with my degree in epidemiology. So I would love to continue on in the maternal and child health field and work as a maternal and child health epidemiologist. Uh, it's particularly focused on um, the social determinants of health, focus on uh, these gendered and um, as well as racial and ethnic disparities. Um, I've been lucky that I've been able to have internships uh, at federal and state level and so to go back to that level and do this broad research, but that can also be translated into uh, programs that can be implemented uh, at the community level. Um, that would be a dream. So thank you for asking. Yeah, that's great. That's a hard interviewer question uh, as always. And I'm certain um, you'll end up in a great spot and uh, I'm certain you have, you'll be having people knock on your doors. So let's wrap up here. I just want to say uh, thank all of our uh, wonderful panelists. I actually personally leave uh, feeling a lot more optimistic. Thanks for bringing that in uh, about where we're headed because of people like you. And uh, Anna mentioned something there that I just want to end on, you know, about this uh, privilege, right? It, it's, I, it's privileged to be in environmental health and public health and be able to research these topics that are so important to us and to so many. And with that privilege comes deep responsibility and particularly around uh, advancing gender equity. So uh, thank you all for just an absolutely wonderful uh, set of presentations uh, and discussion. And thank you to Maria and Women MC for uh, hosting us and bringing uh, us in. So Maria. Great. I'll spend 32 seconds uh, saying thank you from Women MC. And if Issa is on and could put that final slide up, uh, just to tell you all um, where you can reach us. We have done a recording of this. It needs to upload. I need to put it out there. Some folks have asked me in the chat and other ways to have um, a recording of this. I think I could pass it on to you. It'll be a long one, but we'll certainly have it on uh, Women NC's website. And um, I, if there's that last slide, Issa, do you have that by chance with everybody's web address? Um, I will, um, we, we hope to get that slide up, but womennc.org is easy. Um, that's an easy one to remember. Um, and let's see, maybe 
uh, Anna Perez, do you know the web address off the top of your head for the Global Gender Center? <laughs> I don't. <laughs> oh, here we go. Here's the slide. So nobody has to remember. So the reason I wanted to put this up is because if you want to contact us, here are three websites for your viewing pleasure. Um, the gendercenter.rti.org, www.forhealth.org is healthy buildings. You can ask questions, get more information, um, and talk to folks um, who gave these presentations. We will have all of this up. I know that Healthy Buildings is going to be distributing it. Uh, I think RTI is, and we will as well. I'll leave you with one final note uh, that Joe ended us with, and that was sort of echoed by at least Anna Perez, if not every single person, turning policy into practice. I hope all of you listening have heard that, that what the next generation, the current researchers are doing is not only giving us, as Sandra Tedesco said, good data, good numbers, but then actually using that to inform policy, to change practice, and to improve the world. Um, and I think we heard about all of that today. So many thanks to the audience, many thanks to Joe Allen and everyone at the Healthy Buildings Program at RTI and at Emory University's Rollins School of Public Health. We appreciate it and hope uh, that, we'll, that you all will continue the good work and we'll hope to continue to highlight it. So thank you everybody and have a good day or evening depending on where you are. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I will, we didn't have a lot of participants um, and, but I think we have a bigger audience on YouTube. So I'll let you know about that. Um, and I will get that recording to you, all right? But I may not be able to email it because that's what I'm worried about. I may have- We're to currently share. recording and live on Facebook. Oh. It's still recording. Okay. Well.